So the theme of this conference is the future of Rwanda with or without uh, the current president, Paul Um He's now serving his second time. In 2017, there will be new elections. According to the constitution, uh, he cannot serve for uh, a third term. So the question is, what uh, will uh, uh, the regime do? Will they try to change the constitution? Will they, will Kagame uh, uh, point uh, a follow-up? Uh, or will something completely different happen? A uh, lot of questions. Luckily, we have five excellent speakers who will give, uh, try to give some answers. Um, there's room for questions after all the speakers have uh, 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 said something, because otherwise there won't be any room for, uh, for the last speaker. So, Helen. Would you be so kind to... Uh, well, I can't take Paul's case. No, 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 no. I don't want you to take Paul's case. I brought some books along today, however, which I wanted to briefly discuss, because I am an academic. <laughs> Um, the first is the story that Paul Sesabagina put into a, a book. That's the first one. So anyone who's interested can read that book. So you shouldn't just watch the film. The second is a book which was produced called After Genocide, which actually has a foreword from President Kagame in it. It's about six or seven pages forward. And um, this is compulsory reading for my students. Why? Because in it, although it's only a very short uh, forward, he gives quite a concise view on his uh, opinion on the issues that you've just raised, actually. Issues of identity, issue of whether you use the term Tutsi genocide or genocide, etc. So it's quite interesting. So uh, uh, this is a book which has a majority of the chapters, I think, by Rwandans, and it was one of the first books that actually included uh, members of the government, survivors' statements, and so on, along with other academic chapters. And the final book I want to mention is this one, which has been receiving quite a lot of critical interest. It was produced a few years ago now. Uh, it's called The Order of Genocide. And what this book really um, achieves is it manages to show the system, the systematic nature, but also the system, the logic, and the ideology uh, through the eyes, uh, partly at least, of 100 perpetrators, convicted perpetrators. They were interviewed in prison by the uh, author, and with obviously interpreters, translators, and then on the basis of those interviews and lots of other records, also at the local level, in particular specific commune, uh, the author, Scott Strauss, who did his PhD, is also a former journalist, I have to say, journalists seem to make good academics, um, maybe because they're nosy, and uh, they can ask good questions, and on the basis of his case study of 100 uh, perpetrators, convicted perpetrators, he came to conclusions that were a little bit different from some other academics. So I do recommend that study, The Order of Genocide, by Scott Strauss. Okay, I'm not reading here, so I'll just uh, read, read off this paper. Now, I feel a little, I felt a little nervous coming to this debate, to be quite honest, today. I was advised by a couple of my friends not to come along, and the reason I was advised not to come along is there is an individual. There is an individual who's not here and who should be speaking right now. And because he was on the platform, I was advised by my friends not, not to be here today. So I'm here against advice, actually. Um, but I thought, well, I'd like to do this for Anne's sake. She wants some debate. I mean, if people bow out of debates, there'll be no debate. So I'm here, okay. Kind of under sense of obligation. Uh, I think actually I'm not as far out on a limb as I thought I'd be. I agree with Alphonse, I agree with some of the things said by the previous speaker as well, Olivier. Um, I, I think that there are two oversimplified stories about Rwanda which pervade the web, media, and they also pervade scholarship. And both these stories damage our understanding of Rwandan realities. So I'm just going to talk about that, and for once in my life I'm going to be Usually I just talk, but today I want to read this. Okay, so the title of today's debate is Rwanda. Is there a future without Kagame? Well, of course there's a future without Kagame. There's a future with Kagame, there's a future without Kagame. The shape the future takes, I think, depends on Rwandans. Uh, there is a Vision 2020 document which the government aims to make Rwanda a middle-income country by 2020. That's seven years from now. Rwandans themselves are quite capable of deciding how their own future shapes up 
Of course, they don't do it in a vacuum. <coughs> Donors and global economic actors influence what goes on inside Rwanda. They influence the environment in which Rwanda trades and so on. But if donors pull out, then I think they cannot hope to influence the future of Rwanda. In fact, they don't really have a say. So can we imagine such a debate in Kigali? Thank you, uh, Alphonse. Should the Dutch government resign because of the crisis? Should the UK have a future beyond David Cameron? I was just picturing this happening in Kigali. So why are we debating Rwanda's future today? I think in one way or another we are all engaged with Rwanda. In my case, my engagement gives me the feeling that I need to think carefully and talk responsibly. It gives me no rights or privileges to know about Rwanda or to be interested in it beyond that. The reality I also want to state at the beginning is that there was a genocide in 1904. The Tutsi were the main target. Hutu or Tuasina supporting Tutsi were also targeted. This fact now cannot be denied. Therefore, forms of literal denial have reduced in the past few years. What you have now is an interpretative, if you like to call it, or accusatory denial. So I was advised uh, to, to, to mention this at the beginning. Although the genocide happened 20 years ago, and it was not civil war, it was planned, centrally organized, and targeted killing, it was in line with the definition of genocide under the Genocide Convention. It was planned. I studied it in 1999. I published the first article I produced on the subject called Explaining the 94 Genocide in Rwanda. A bit ambitious title, but it was used in the ICTR, so as it was for a reading. I was accused of being a Tutsi PhD student in an anonymous review. I was extremely complimented, but anyway, that was the case in 1999. Um, genocide is, however, not a law, a theory, or academic study. It's the history, as you mentioned, it's the past. And Rwandans may want to keep it in the past in some cases. For the whole month of April, they spend time mourning loved ones. Uh, they, they mourn all sorts of different people who died at different points. However, they all share that experience of mourning. And I think the idea that is most damaging of all was the idea of race. And indeed, this idea of race was brought into Rwanda by the colonizers. This is why genocide ideology, divisionism are now criminalized. I'm not saying that the laws cannot be misused, but talking of Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa is not something I like to do anymore. The aim of this is simply, this, the aim of the laws, in, in principle, the genocide ideology and divisionism laws, is to protect Rwandans from identity politics. In one of my papers, I call identity politics a knife in the context of Rwanda and the Great Lakes. It's not something you want children or adults to play with. You do not let uh, people uh, use it as a, as a game. So I think the official position that they want Rwandan identity to be <coughs> that they want Rwandans to identify with one another is a very serious and reasonable belief under the circumstances. Let's say I'm an outsider expert. I spend my whole life studying Rwandan agriculture or politics or questions of society. Yet, it's not my opinion that counts. It's Rwandan's opinion that counts. Ordinary Rwandans, in the end, they decide through millions of daily decisions, not only on the outcome of elections, but on what happens as a result of legal and constitutional reform and on the wider direction of social and economic change. So to really understand what's happening in Rwanda today and what may have a future and who may have a future, those of us who live outside the country, who don't go back there, or who may not go back there often or at all, we may first just need to quieten down a little bit and listen to what's going on inside. Because there's so much noise going on among the diaspora, among the global scholars, among the global media, and on the internet, that sometimes it's really difficult to hear what is happening inside Rwanda and public opinion inside the country. And I think it's shifting in major ways. Um, there's a saying in English, problem shared is a problem half. I think this is finally what may be, begin, may be beginning to happen inside Rwanda. Something that's been started in recent years is the national dialogues. I'm trying to pronounce the word properly. Okay, and although the president oversees these dialogues, they do aim to bring together the whole of society so people can debate and solve their problems. Now, I've not seen something quite like this anywhere else, although there's a few countries where they have similar things. But public servants are supposed to become answerable to the population. Not always a comfortable experience for public servants. I wouldn't like to be answerable to my students. Um, I'm reminded of the slogan of the Socialist Party in Angola. It was in Portuguese. That's my Portuguese finish. Uh, and it means the most important thing is to solve the problems of the people. But this is really the key thing I want to emphasize in this debate, to the extent to the extent that the government is shifting in this direction and starting to listen to its citizens, it deserves uh, support and credit. 
Yet, as the government does this, donors pull out. So in the past two years, the UK, the Netherlands, and some other donors have made quite significant cuts. Of course, they made it on other grounds, other than the national dialogue. But I think self-reliance is being imposed on Rwanda today by uh, some of the budget uh, conditions. So my suggestion is that critics of the government need to acknowledge some deep changes taking place inside Rwanda. The national economy has been transformed since 94. Social attitudes and mindsets are undergoing a kind of quiet revolution. There's more willingness to tackle, tackle difficult problems, including ideas that are a bit innovative, like land sharing, gender equality, and health care of different kinds. I am not just saying this for propaganda reasons. I do think that there are really serious uh, innovations taking place. For example, in health insurance, and why shouldn't we have safe public transport in a country like Rwanda? Why should it be a joke that Rwandans wear helmets on their motorbikes? Um, the government needs revenue. Where can it find this revenue? <clears throat> if the donors don't pay, then the answer is taxation, which is definitely increasing. And taxes are paid. Non-filers are identified. How intrusive, you may say. But Kagame's government is resolute in modernizing every single aspect of society. People are brought into villages from dispersed dwellings, provided with services, whether they like it or not. If, in, in Rwanda in general these days, if you want to work to improve your own life collectively, then you must also make access and make use of public services. The regime would like you to have your child in a hospital so that if something goes wrong, you could, you could get medical attention. They are, would like everyone to go to primary school and finish primary school, whatever their condition. So if the underlying belief is modernizing, the attitude is that if something works in the wider world, why shouldn't it be tried in Rwanda? If, if something can benefit Rwandans and it may bring greater security, peace or self-reliance, then why not? So for critics, the present regime is far, far removed from ordinary poor Rwandans. Yet, in a few short years, there have been amazing improvements in, in many indicators. In infant and mortality, in maternal mortality, in educational attainment of boys, and especially of girls. And all this is testimony that the government in place in Rwanda is doing what it can to improve everyday conditions for citizens, for those inside the country. There is a kind of can-do attitude among many public servants. It's the counterpart of very tight and unpleasant performance contracts that everyone must sign. But these are regularly reviewed for everyone, from ministers downwards, as we were reminded this morning by one of my students. Why not for the president too? Why not have a performance contract for him, for Kagame? Well, we do. It's called elections. And I know that they're manipulated. The government is very keen to keep a control of political opposition. This is true. They are extremely vigilant, not to say sometimes aggressive, against perceived enemies of government. But is this so surprising? After the Second World War, denazification required a whole new ideology so that those who'd been guilty of complicity in genocide crimes would be brought to account, like Eichmann, so that Germans wouldn't continue with the same ideology they'd had before the war. Rwanda is still undergoing its own painful version of denazification. The removal of genocide ideology and racial identity politics is an ongoing task. Of course the Rwandan government does not just counter genocide ideology. It can also persecute its enemies of political opposition. And many governments indeed do this. It would be abnormal if it didn't. But many who have opposed the government have been killed, have fled the country. This now includes, as one speaker said, many who were close to those in power, such as the former chief of staff of the army, former ambassadors and higher up intelligence officials. There have been attacks on exiles, including assassinations and character assassinations. And all this is on record, and I cannot justify any of it. The only people I can justify the government attacking is former criminals who have committed genocide crimes, who should be brought to justice, blah, blah, blah. Right, now, the liberal model promoted by Western donors insists every country should have a multi-party democracy. Yet, Rwanda illustrates perfectly the risks of this model. In the early 1990s, that's precisely what Rwanda had. There was multi-partyism, and the result was proliferation of lethal genocide ideology and the machinery of genocide. And if everyone is free to say whatever they want, then hatred and racial antagonism become part of the order of the day in Rwanda. And is this really what we want for Rwanda? Do we want a country that has suffered collectively this much, to have the same risks of multi parties and dividing people up along identity lines in the future. The present situation may not be ideal, it certainly is far from that, but doesn't the present situation at least have the advantage that instead of blaming one another en masse for their problems, the politics of Rwanda at least is about practical issues. Poverty, land use, gender equality, coexistence. These are now viewed as everyone's problem, problems shared and hopefully one day solved. So I will conclude. 
To my mind, it doesn't matter whether Paul can have his taste in power beyond 2017, and it's really not my business to say if he should or not. What matters is whoever is in power would continue to work hard to tackle problems of ordinary Rwandans, and this does finally seem to be happening today. I would say it has finally started in the last five years or so. I just sometimes wish that for a short while, the diasporic opposition to Kagame and the many scholars who criticize his regime as having committed this or that crime could just rest their pens and keyboards for a while and start to look for things that work and to find some solutions. Frankly, I am personally tired of the very polarized and extreme debates that are expressed concerning Rwanda. It's neither heaven nor hell. It's certainly not a plaything for those of us living outside the country. It's a country full of people trying their best to manage with what they have and trying in every way to creatively resolve their issues and tackle problems so huge and complex they're hard to imagine. I'm going to conclude with two simple requests. First of all, let's stop talking about Rwanda for a while and instead see what's going on there. Second request, how about, uh, this is a humble request, <laughs> perhaps the Rwandan government could even consider hosting a special dialogue conference. Maybe after the 20th anniversary of the genocide has passed next year, a dialogue could be held in Kigali to which all scholars and media critics who seem to hate the regime so much could be invited in order to have visas, give them visas but not money, and ask them to come to Kigali and have an open debate. This would do much more with breaking down the polarization in the Rwandan scholarship that's still there, unfortunately, and in the news. The two contrasting versions of Rwanda, the Singapore of Africa, the hub for IT, the place for miracle cures, all nutcases can come here, or the authoritarian, all-surveilling state. These two fairy tales ignore the real complexity of Rwanda emerging from genocide. Rwandans living inside the country are hardly heard amidst all the noise, so I would just say one more time, it's time to focus on them. And it's ironic that at the very time that national dialogues are being initiated in Rwanda and other such innovations, due to partly cuts in donor funding, that donors withdraw their trust and donors withdraw their support. So to return to the debate's title, I don't know what the future holds for Rwanda with or without the president. Ordinary Rwandans, including the shrinking number who don't complete primary school, know this better than me, so ask them. And the decision will be heavily influenced by the regional and the global context. So maybe those of us who live outside Rwanda, if we want to make a difference for ordinary or poor Rwandans, we can do this by campaigning for fair trade, for better treatment of debt issues, and for proper respect for land, land rights and workers' rights by international actors. This is probably the best thing we can do for the government and the future of Rwanda. We can work closer to home. Thank you. Um, I've got one more question for you. Yes, of course. Um, um, you were talking about uh, the changes in Rwanda, the positive changes in Rwanda, um, and also about uh, um, uh, the multi-party system not really working for Rwanda at the moment. Um, we all know that um, there are a, a lot of opposition politicians in uh, the jail and prison in, in Rwanda. Uh, Lynn, uh, the husband of the Kwaak in Gambiri, is here as well. And um, I would li really like to have a short view uh, of you on, on the trial of in Gambiri and um, the, the political space. Uh, well, the only thing I did want to say, and I told you earlier I would say this, was that I, I thought that the Dutch government was well out of order in the way that they behaved. And I think if Dutch citizens want to make a difference, they should really, really examine the record of their government on cooperating with regimes in harassing their residents here in the Netherlands. Now, I'm not including in that definition people who've committed crimes of genocide. I think it's perfectly appropriate for the Dutch government to try Dutch, even Dutch citizens of Rwandan origin, like they have done in the last couple of years. There have been two cases of convictions. I think, that's, I think that's admirable, and they should continue with that. But what I don't agree is that on the basis of a request that you go and raid somebody's home and remove their computer and make their family feel like that person is already a criminal, I think that went a little bit far. I think the Interpol cooperation is all very well, but this could happen to any one of us. And it may not be with the Rwandan government, maybe with some other government. So what's to stop the Indonesian government bringing up the, the, the Dutch police and saying, we've got a chap we don't like over there, could you just go and raid his house and get his computer, take a soft drive and hand it over to us? I think that that is, it's, I find that um, going a bit too far in cooperation. I think they should do their own investigation in Rwanda. I don't think that the Dutch government should hand over lock, stock and barrel 
um, evidence to governments, uh, whether it's Rwanda or Indonesia or wherever. I don't think that's part of Interpol, but I could be wrong. Maybe I don't know much enough about the law. Yeah, uh, then, then how do you expect the justice system to work? Because I understand she was accused of, I think, four crimes. And one of the crimes was that uh, she was uh, in complicity with others in formation of uh, uh, a, a, a rebel movement or something like mm -hmm. that sort. And the reason I, I probably suspect, because among the things those that were accused produced as evidence included emails. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can determine the origin of the email, it includes determining through the computer and the, and the server on which the email might have originated. Mm -hmm. So how do you, on one hand, support justice, and on the other hand say, well, don't give them the authority to have the evidence, and then they do it their way. <laughs> to my opinion, I think... So why was she not tried in the Netherlands if the evidence in the Netherlands is against her? I think, I no, find it... She, she's, in, she's tried in Rwanda because that's where she the crime she is being accused. Yeah. Ah, mm. And our crimes for, uh, that affects Rwanda, mm. then through judicial cooperation with any other, mm. unless if you're going to break every legal system in this world, and then you say, well, each country on its own, and then one criminal will commit a crime here and then lands to another country, and that's it. Mm. I'm not saying that she's, she's, she, she's a criminal. I'm saying that the judicial cooperation should remain, mm. because it is the only possible way the evidence can be corrected. Maybe Jan has got some thoughts on this. Yeah, well, He's a lawyer. Well, so. I lost the case, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it has been signed an international treaty by Rwanda and Holland about uh, anti-terroristic uh, uh, acts. And if you sign such a treaty, you have to help. And that was... The, well, the way they did was a little bit uh, rough in the morning. But they told me that they were there with... Uh, uh, 20 policemen uh, to do the work very fast so it will not be that uh, disturbing the family but it was of course uh, not really very yeah. no, I, I don't know the manner in which they did it but the police no, no, for itself to my opinion <coughs> is, is, is normal to, well, to correct evidence it's because of the, the signing of the, the, the treaty the maybe the moment was also not very lucky because one day the police was raiding the house in Zevenhausen and the other day, uh, the, the the same Dutch government was withholding money, uh, was withholding financial support. So it was also a very strange moment <coughs> to do both things.